Father Lord, we thank you once again. We exalt your name. Holy Spirit, come down in that power. Manifest your glory in the midst of your church. We have gathered once again, not for self-glorification, not for self-gratification, but to show us your grace, to teach your word, to have insight into your Lord. Guide us, O Lord, with your help. Grant us understanding by the help of your Holy Spirit. Help us not to be seen on earth. But let your word be declared that all who heard it might understand. Teach us your guidance principle that in everything, only your name and your name alone will be glorified. For in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Brethren, you are welcome once again to this open house fellowship. This open house fellowship is a meeting where we use an opportunity to expand the mission teaching in our fellowship class where the Christians in CGF meet together. CGF is a non-denominational group which focuses on mission training, sending and commissioning of missionaries. We meet together every Tuesday by 7 p.m. To teach the word of God, to ensure that the people of God are equipped, prepared to meet their desired missionary goal. Brethren, we are happy for you to join us. You can go to our website, register to have it set up in your areas. God bless you as you participate. Today's teaching is an exciting one. My name is Missionary Collins. I'll be your host for this evening. The teaching is discipling a church. How do we disciple a church to make it effective and useful for the purpose why God set it up? That is what we shall be taking a look at today. Before we commence, I want us to bow our heads again once again for prayer. Lord Jesus, your people have come to receive from you. Let them not be disappointed. Let them not listen to the sound of man, but let them listen to the sound of your word. Grant us divine understanding, as many that come with expectancy, with a heart of expectation, their expectation will be met. As many that come sick, they will be healed. As many that come sitting in bondage, their bones will be lifted. As many that comes to you, O oh Lord, having a mind to give it up, to quit in life, Lord, you will meet them at the expectation of their needs. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brethren, you are welcome once again to this open house fellowship where every dreams are met, where believers join together in common realization of the teaching of Christ. We are children of God. As children of God, our doctrine is to make disciples of all nations. This is not a sermon, but it's our mandate. This is the only job we are given as Christians. To make disciples of all nations, to baptize them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And this discipling, though it's not a form of sermon being taught in church, but every church has it at the back of their mind, that the real reason why we build churches or set up a gathering or open fellowship is for this sole reason. To disciple people to maturity so that when they themselves are matured, they will go and disciple other people. And that is the purpose for today's teaching. We use the opportunity to gather the same together for only one purpose disciple them so that they themselves, in turn, 
we have the ability to disciple other people. Our text today is taken from the book of Matthew chapter 20 verse 19 and Luke chapter 9 verse 1 to 6. And we shall be taking a great dive into the scripture, looking at Jesus' discipling style and how we can apply it to our day-to-day -day activities in the church. That is the teaching for today. God bless you as you participate. Before we start, what is the reason why churches need discipline? Why is Christian committed to discipling a church rather than just simply discipling ourselves, preparing our mandate for heaven? Before we dive into these scriptures, let's read the book of Matthew chapter 28 verse 19. Matthew 28, 19. Matthew 28, 19. This was the last statement Jesus made to us as he was about to be to ascend into heaven. When he was about to ascend into heaven, he said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The sapling is teaching teaching the art of teaching what do we need to teach all nations we have they not already heard from the evangelists their word has gone throughout all the earth what does they need teaching i wrestle with this statement when i really started the ministry my first years in mission, as a missionary, I begin to wonder myself. I have finished preaching the gospel in the location where God sent me to. I have had to say with them. In fact, souls were saved, deliverance were performed. But don't you think that is all? Shouldn't I just move on to the next location? where I can also preach to them since I have finished preaching here. While I was contemplating on that word, the Lord said something to me in the night as I sleep in a vision. You see that demon who cast out yesterday? I say yes. He said I want you to carry him or her in your hand. Until they are matured enough to be able to teach the gospel as you do. That is discipleship. That's what God expects from every minister. As long as you are a child of God, not only a minister, but Christian, if you are a child of God, God does not only expect you to preach the word, but he expects you to teach them, to baptize them, both with water and of the Holy Spirit. To prepare them for the work of the ministry. Because the Lord knows fully well, no matter the calling you have, you cannot do the job alone. We need each other to survive. We need each other materially, spiritually, physically, financially. We need each other to survive. We all are God's children. I need you, you need me. And I believe we all need each other because we tax one another. We cannot make up a body. The body of Christ are many, but we are one. But we are only one in the terms of unity. That does not mean we should merge all the houses of God together to make it one big church like the universal church as they try in the dark ages that fails but no what god expected of us though we be many we should have one mind one purpose finishing the great commission preparing the saints for the work of the ministry and being able 
to prepare them until they meet with their Lord on his final return. That is our job. The job of the church is to take people first and foremost to their Lord who died for them. If I bring people to myself, I did not die for anybody on the cross. So, bringing them to myself is useless. I should rather lead them to the one that died for them on the cross. But how can they come to him? Except one teaches them. Many cannot receive from him because they don't have faith. And they cannot have faith except they hear. And they cannot hear except someone teaches them. That is the reason. And they cannot be taught except one become a teacher and teach the gospel the way it is written. That's why Jesus expects us as believers not only to preach the word in signs and healings and deliverance, but to mature the word so that the people that once need you to lay hand on them for healing will come to a point in their life where they do not need you. They will be able to lay hands on their own sickness by themselves and be healed. They will be able to cast out devil whenever they meet one. They will be able to stand the lion then, tread upon dangerous ground, eat poisonous food, take the serpents by their hands, and nothing will by any means hurt them. That is what it means to disciple people to maturity. When is the period of our discipline? Should it be for a period of two weeks, one month, six weeks, one year? A believer discipline is throughout a lifetime. Discipline does not mean you cannot go out on evangelism. You have to stay put until you finish your discipleship class. No. Even in CGF, we don't do that. We believe discipling is an act of practice. We disciple you. You go forth, disciple others. While you are discipling others, you are also learning from yourself. And in the process, the process of discipling is rotatory. It goes into cell division. Cell multiplication. All these are forms of discipline. Church, some churches planting church planting. Church planting is a period where they gather people together and they form a name church, where they disciple them for a period, perhaps throughout their lifetime. But that is not the discipline we are talking about here. It, a master expects a disciple to mature. If you have, for example, a student in your classroom, you teach the children for the first year, and it, you need to promote him from class A to class B. But what happens if you teach the student for 15 years and he's still in class A? People are going to ask you a question. That means you're either a terrible teacher or you have a terrible student. So God expects us also as believers not to keep people in perpetual captivity. He wants us to disciple them and let them loose. So that when they are matured, they can in turn train order. That's what the Bible says to us last week. That the things you have heard and received commit to faithful men who will be able to what? Teach others also. God called you alone, maybe in your dream, vision, of by word of mouth. And He teach you through a process of life experience. Are you going to tell your member for you to be trained? You have to go through the same experience that I have with sin, with the word, with affliction, with pains. No. When they come to you, your job is to use your life experience to disciple them for a period of time. And when they are being discipled, putting your personal experience, the Bible, 
outreach, physical evangelism, and commitment into practice and focus in the discipling process. They are expected also to grow at both in maturity, in speech, grow in ability to stand before the cloud, grow in ability to stand before the church and do the work of the ministry. So God expects disciples to be able to be like their master. Even Jesus said, all this work you see me do, I want you to do greater work than this. Do you know why? Because I go to my father. You help Jesus heal the sick, raise the dead, heal the paralytics, drive on leprosy. He said he wants you to do greater work than that. And that cannot be done if you are a naive, fearful, and dreadful Christian who hide away and shy away from the gospel of truth, unable to stand before the cloud, not filled with the Holy Spirit. But you need the conviction and the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to do that. And not everybody has the ability to pray for the Holy Spirit for themselves. So God expects us to lay hands on the weak brethren and fill them with the Holy Spirit. God expects us to communicate the meaning of baptism to believers so that they can be equipped to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Because how does faith to receive the Spirit come? It comes by hearing. And how does hearing comes? By the understanding of the Word of God we understood. That's how hearing comes. God expects us today as believers not only to teach the Word, but to be instant in season and act of season. That means we should teach it at a convenient time. We should teach it as an unconvenient time. A time when people do not expect the word of God to be taught, the word of God should be taught. A time when people do not expect discipleship to be the norm, the sapling should be. It should be when you sit down at dinner. It should be when you sit with your groups and friends. Because Jesus did something unusual. His disciples sat with him to eat at, with him at dinner. He did not only show them through parable, the kingdom of heaven. He came, he guided towers around his waist, and he carried a bowl of water, and he began to wash their feet, one after the other. In fact, none of them, all of them were speechless until he came to Peter. Peter said, Lord, you will not wash my feet. And Jesus looked at Peter, if I do not wash your feet, you are not my disciple. And Peter said, Lord, it is not only my feet. Let me go take off my shirt. You bath my entire body. Why was it disgusting for Peter to see his master wash his feet? The reason is simple because in Hebrew, feet washing or hand washing ritual are practiced at dinner, before prayer. But the feet washing is usually done by a servant, a lesser being, not the master of the house. But in this case, you see feet washing being practiced not by a servant, but rather the master of the house. Who is this master? Jesus. He is the owner of the feast. He is the one teaching the apostle that their feet need being washed. At this time, not by a servant, but by the master. Peter was surprised. This is not a job for a master. We, the servants, are supposed to wash your feet, not the other way around. It's just like you walking into your office and you saw the director 
who employs you doing the laborer's job that is meant for the local construction workers. You begin to wonder. This job are not meant for the directors. This job were meant for the local workers. That was exactly what Peter felt. The job that Jesus was doing was not meant for the man or the owner of the house. It was meant for servants. Then Peter insists. Jesus made him understood. You do not understand what I do now. With time, you will understand. But Peter insists, you have to explain first. When Jesus has done washing their feet, he sat down and made them understand. You call me Lord and Master, and that is who I right, that is what I am. But if your Lord and Master could wash your feet, each of you must wash one another's feet, even the least of you. And anybody that wants to be the head among you, let he be the servant of all. That is discipling. Not only telling, but showing how it is done. This is our study today. We are going to dive into the lifestyle of Christ. How he disciples his followers. And we are going to apply it to our Christian life. And search through the scriptures to see examples of how the church we are discipling. And so that we can apply it to our local mission team, to our local fellowship group, to our local churches, and be able to practice discipleship every day of our life. God bless you as you participate. Brother, once again, you are welcome to this Open House Fellowship. If you have missed any of our program, you can still join us at CGF nslogin.app cgf nslogin.app Join our fellowship team or you can search Global Pastoral and Missionary Forum on Facebook or CGF Open Hearts on Facebook. You will be able to participate in this program. God bless you as you participate. Brethren, our test is taken from the book of Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9 from verse 1 to 6. Luke 9 verse 1 to 6. Then he called his twelve to disciples together and gave them what? Power. The discipleship cannot be concluded until your follower receive what? Authority. Dynamic authority or dynamics. This authority enable them to go out. Teaching alone will not complete what they need. Remember what Christ told us. We are not sent as sheep in the midst of sheep. We are sent as sheep in the midst of wolves. There are wolves out there. And those wolves are not interested in making peace. Those wolves are not interested in listening to what you have to say. Those wolves, they are interested in your life. Taking it away. Hanging you upside down, as they did in the case of Peter. Slaughtering you with a sword, as they do in the case of Paul. That is the job of the wolves. And the Lord expects you to go in the midst of wolves. Those who have red eyes. Who roar like a lion. And the Lord expects you to preach to them. To minister love to them. To preach love in the midst of hate. To preach joy in the midst of sorrow. To preach deliverance in the midst of captivity. Recovering of sight in the midst of blindness. That is your message. But how can this message be preached without confrontation? How can a lamb walk? Free in the lion den, he needs a divine empowerment. He needs divine empowerment that brings us to the second phase of discipleship empowerment. And that's why Jesus, when he was risen 
from the dead. He told the disciple, do not go out yet. I know I sent you out. I gave you power when I was still with you. But now tarry yet in Jerusalem. Stay there. Do not move. Don't just pray. Stay on your knee. Wait for the promise of the Father until you be endued with the power from on high. As much as easy the gospel is all about taking your Bible to your next door neighbor, you need power. You need power. You can't just go out until he endows you with power from on high. And that power is what energizes you to be bold. That power is what makes you to stand before king and not men men. That power is what gives you the boldness and the courage to take the souls from the mouth of the lion without compromise. You need power. That power is what makes you come before the death and knew that the dead can be raised, that the lame can walk, that the paralytic they can run, that the blind eyes could be opened, that those who sit in darkness, light can still shine. That is the power you need. And where will that power come from? From on high, from the Lord Himself. By the power of the Holy Spirit. And who is this power for? Is it for selected ministers, evangelists, pastors, deacons? No. This power for is for you, for your children, children, for as many as the Lord our God we call. These are the people which this power is for. This power is not just for some few believers. Who narrow the tricks, who walks about and preach the gospel. No, this power is for every believer that would yet to come to the Lord. And that is what you need. And this power work with knowledge. Because the Bible says, when the Holy Spirit shall come into you, he will take off mine and expand it to you. He is going to take off the deposit. Of the spiritual word of God in your heart and expose it or expand it to you. And it's going to keep your faith built on those words. And with it, you can do all things. Not so few things. Because all things are possible to him that dare to believe. All things are possible. All things. When I reach the word all things, I always pause. Because he didn't say some things. He didn't say some few things. He didn't say many things. He said all things. Whatever situation you are confronted with are possible if you can't believe. But how can you be confident enough to believe? And not deny the Lord like Peter when you are faced with real life threatening dangers. How do you not hide in the missionary back when you get to the mission field? Because one lady doctor tell you, if you don't leave this village, I'm going to kill you. A one man with gun or sword said to you, this is our town. God is not welcome here. Why don't you run away? And they said, look now, before I open my eyes and close it, I want you to keep running. And you have not even started the message that brought you there in the first place. And you begin to cry on your way home. God, why me? God, why me? You just sent me here to disgrace me. If you know you are not going to be with me, why don't you send me? Moses said to the Lord, Lord, do not suffer us to be carried away from here. If your presence will not come with us, should you do your pr prayer at that point? Shouldn't you have take the Lord with you from the home before you go there? Before you meet with that man? And when the man said to you, I open my eyes and close it and I want you to disappear. You're going to try to look at the man and says, the ex is the Lord. 
and the fullness thereof. The world and everything that live therein are his. You have no right to command me before I open my eyes and open it. I want you to either surrender to God or run away. And you will see God will honor your word. The Lord you serve is a quickening fire. And it's a consuming fire. So you don't dear him. Nobody can stab him and stick balance. The Lord is able to do exceedingly above anything you can think, ask, or even imagine in your heart. The calling and the serving of the Lord are not mystical. They are reality. And God's plans and his ways are not your imagination. They are not head knowledge. You cannot fathom his miracles. No wonder God told Gideon to reduce the men to 300. He gave an army as the sand, and the Bible recorded it in the seashore. 300 army. <laughs> the Lord asked him to reduce it to 300, not to, against an army that were more than millions. He said, because if I even leave these people with 3,000, when you win, they will say, we are a mighty warrior. Our hands has given us victory. The Lord will not share his glory with any man. The Lord will not share his glory with any man. That's why to today I don't believe there is any superman of God. We all take advantage of the glory of God that he has already prepared. We take advantage of his power. We take advantage of his glory. We take advantage of his saving grace. And for you to be able to take advantage, you need the knowledge. And for you to be able to retain the knowledge in the middle of fear and adversity, you need the Spirit. For you to be able to strengthen the ability of the Spirit, you need a deposit where the Spirit will feed from. The deposit of knowledge. That is discipleship. And that's what we are looking into today. God expects you not only to be quick, in equipping in his word, but also to understand the detailed meaning of each word that proceeds from your mouth and the effect. And that is how the word carried weight. <clears throat> Verse 1 He said, He called it well together, He gave them authority. Authority and power over all devils. Is this some devils? You get to some demons, say this one, no, this one have one. Like one of my mission cohorts always says, we say this one, don't get it. No. God gave you authority, dominions, over all devils. Not some devils, not some measured or some few devils. Not many devils, but all devils. You have authority over all devils. God has given you that authority. Not over some few demons, but over all devils. And God expects you to use that authority wisely. Not only use it to cast out devils, use it to heal the sick, use it to raise the dead, use it to take the cattle and set them loose. That is authority has given you. Because we know who the devil is. He is a thief. And we know his job as a thief. He's coming to steal your salvation. He's coming to steal your life. Is coming to steal your joy, to steal your blessing, to steal your confidence, to steal everything that is good in you. That is what thief normally come to steal. The thief does not break into your house to dance disco. He does not come into your house because he just looking for a place to hang out. That is not the job of the thief. The thief comes for nothing else than to steal to kill 
and to destroy. Destroy things, take lives. But I tell you, Christ came into that house. That's why he is at the door of every heart this minute. And you know what he's doing? Knocking. And knocking very hard. If anyone dare to open into him, the door for him, he will come into that heart. He will suck with that person. And that person will suck with him forever. He is coming into your house to eat with you at dinner. Not only to eat with you, but to give life into that thing that the thief has stolen from your life. To put life into that life that the devil has taken away. To give life into those things that are dead, that are buried, that are ready to die, that need quickening. That is the purpose why he is coming. He is the bearer of good news. He knows his sheep, and they hear his voice from a distance, and they follow him. As much as I hate to believe it, there are two competing factors in the world. We have the seeds of the woman, and we have the seed of the serpent. Each of them has seed. The seed of the serpent are thieves. They came not to steal your peace, to break your home, cause divorces in marriage, cause affliction to the life of your children. Wherever they see peace, they hate it. These are the seed of the serpent. But we have the seed of God. And this seed of the serpent, the Bible referred to them as wolf in sheep clothing. Some of us expect when we get there, we are going to see them different, dress differently, act differently. Unfortunately, I'm sorry to disappoint you. They don't dress differently. They don't act differently. They are dressed even better as Christians than they unbelievers are even dressed. You don't know the difference between them by looking. Their faces does not show in appearance. They can be they can mead us like camellias into any shape they want to take or adapt. These are the seed of the serpent. And that's why you need to be discipled. To be able to identify the seed of the serpent. And be able to separate them from the seed of the woman. And remember when God called me, he said to me, find out the people that are on earth. Are there not millions or billions of people on earth? How am I going to differentiate which one to find out? But after years of training, I understand there are two classes. The seed of the woman which the Lord asks me to find out, and the seed of the serpent who has their ways, who will do anything, shift shapes, change their dimension in order to deceive. These are the thieves. Their job, they promise you love, but they give you destruction. They promise you peace, but they themselves are master of captivity. These are the seed of a woman. They promise you things they cannot give, that they don't have themselves. When a thief tells you, I'm going to make you rich, believe you me, he has none in his own house. He is looking for somebody else to steal from, to give to you. Is that the kind of riches you want? When a thief promises you, Life. He don't have life. Where will he get life from? He has to kill someone else to give you a life in that area. That's why the Bible makes it clear to us when you see the wicked rise, you should know that I, the Lord, did not bless him. That all he does is hide somebody else. <laughs> when you see the seed of the serpent rise to glory. 
Do not envy his glory because he has hidden some few people. Because that is the only way the seed of the serpent rise. He does not rise by labor. He does not rise by doing what is right. He rises by hiding other peoples, hiding their destiny, hiding their heads, hiding their glory, hiding their marriage, hiding their business, hiding their finance. That is how he rises. That is the job of the seed of the serpent. They are thieves. They do not pass through the door. The door is not the normal avenue for them. They come through the wall. They go through the windows. They pass back doors because they are not the owner of the house. They are thieves. They are, in fact, if they come to you in their real format, you will never welcome them into your house. And because they knew that, they are going to say, no, please, I stay outside here. Can you just give me water to drink? While you are going to get the water, they are already in your city room. That is who they are. They force their way in. They are forceful. They are pushing. When you go to church and you say to the pastor, sorry, I don't want to worship here anymore. He allows you to go. Do you know what? It's the house of God. You don't force people to worship. But you, when you join an occultic group and you tell them, sorry, I don't want to be belong to your group anymore. They kill you. Because what? There is no former Satan worshiper. To be a former Satan worshiper means you are a former dark. The Lord, they will go after your life with everything they have. The reason is because the devil forced people to worship him. If he lose one, he is not sure of when he can get any replacement. But God says, I said before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life. That you and your children, children may live. That is God. God does not force people to remain in captivity. God does not say, please, don't go to that program because I don't want them to take you away from me. No. God only gives you a guideline. It is your job to overlook the guideline and to follow it if you are wise. And that God tells you a child, as long as he's a child, he should not be treated different from a servant. Because what? Though he is the master of the house, though he owns everything, he should be kept under tutors and governors until the time that the father himself appoints. That is what God does. That's why we disciple people. Because they should be treated no different from a servant. Why they are disciples? Because though they are sons of God, though they are a royal priesthood, though they are a choosing generation, though they are peculiar people who should show forth the praise of God, who has called them out of darkness into his marvelous light, but they have not come to this knowledge yet. They have not yet arrived at this state. So God wants you to treat them no different from a servant. Put them under tutors. Or that governorship to appoint them their meal in their season, to guide them to labor, to teach them to handle until the time that God Himself appoints. That is when they will be free. And that point in time, that freedom will be their driving force, it will be their career. That is exactly what God expects from every believer. Brethren, Let's understand in verse 2. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God. Kingdom. He did not send them to condemn people of their sin. So learn when you are making disciples that your message matters more. The message he sends you is good news. Don't go with evil news. Don't tell people. The Lord said you should repent from your sin now or you die, go to hell. That is a, an evil message. People will not listen to you. There is time for that message. The Bible says among the mature we impart knowledge. But not the knowledge that the people of this world teaches. That comes to nothing. 
but we impart knowledge, the inner knowledge of the spirit, because a carnal man cannot understand the things of the spirit. He cannot even know about them. How? What is the point of teaching somebody things he cannot know? Because they are foolishness in his eyes. He cannot understand it because they are spiritually designed. And that is the reason why when Jesus speaks to the disciples and the rest of Israel, he uses parable. What parable? These are farmer, the things they can see. These are seed, what they plant every year. These are fishermen, they, they go to the river, they cut fish. He teaches them with common things. Things they could understand. Because what is the point of teaching people's theology when their knowledge cannot even carry ordinary mathematics? Why not start from the rudiment of the basis? When God expects us to teach, He doesn't want us to show that we understand the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. That is not the plan. Discipling is one step after another. That's why in CGF, when we start our discipling class, we take four, four courses. And at the end of that four course, we are expected to serve in the ministry while you are learning the remaining. Because those four courses is enough to prepare you for foundation. We take you at the initial stage, four course in leadership, first course in evangelism, first course in church growth, four course in some in a in mini mission. In evangelism, we take you on all these courses for four, so that when you have those basic foundations, you have enough word of God to save the lost. And when you now start saving the lost, you have experience, you can learn the rest. And it become more fruitful for you than for you to say, wait, I want to know the whole Bible school. Off head. Then I can be prepared to go into the mission. No. The thing you heard every Sunday, the thing you receive from the, this open house fellowship, go, commit it into the hand of faithful men. Let them go and show it to other people as well. Don't keep them in one place because it will be difficult for you to be able to hold on to 10,000 people and expect to finance them. In CGF, there is one thing we do not have. We have the war. We have the work. But people don't actually give much because we don't have a church. So because of that, the little resource we have, we commit it to the saving of life for the work of the ministry. To save life in various fields. So because we do not believe in taking place from organization to organization, begging for arm in order for you to preach the gospel, we know that the devil will not will encourage every other thing, but not the gospel. Because it does not build his kingdom. You are not going to tell the devil, bring money for us to destroy your kingdom, so that we can preach the kingdom of God. Which devil will give you that money? When the devil build you the house of God, who will worship there? So that is the purpose. That's why we believe that Christians should build the house of God. Christians should build a house that Christ will return to. We labor. We gather our little incomes together. We use this to preach to the poor, to reach the lost, to save those who were appointed to death. Where our resources stop, we pray to God for provision. That is what I believe is mission. Mission does not wait with plates at the door of every organization begging for food to feed the lost. We know our job is to help the needy. When the Lord, because why mission become more complex that people run away from it these days is because when people are coming to church, they bring offer. When people are coming to the mission, they bring plate and spoon. And they expect you to put food in the plate. That they will eat with that spoon. And that's become a problem when you have no sponsor. You labor hard. Instead of using it to spread the gospel, you use the, the work of your hand to put food in the plate. And what, how will we finish the Great Commission if we labor to put it in the plate? It's almost impossible. 
So what do we do in CJL? We put programs in place. Well, those programs are in our website. You take those programs, we prepare ourselves for the ministry, we go out with the little resource God has provided for us, because most of our believers, while they minister, they work. And with their income from their salaries and their entitlements, they give help to those in various fields. So that they can preach the gospel. That is our method of discipleship. We train our converts to contribute whatever they can to the work of the ministry. So that whenever that contribution comes to a point, we take it to various fields where it can be used to finance buying of tracts, printing of tracts, printing of mission booklets, sending missionary by road to various fields where we preach the gospel. But we are not in the business of holding plates, standing at the door of every financial organization. Please, we want to do the work of God. We just need help. And what happened? The devil will tell you, sorry. We give to charity. But we don't give for you to preach the gospel. Because that is not part of our curriculum. Even sometimes when we ask for donation and offerings online, we have no turn up because we will not go begging. That's why as Christians, you must learn to work within the resources God provided. If you give it up because there is no money, oh God, I would have wanted to go to that place. Because there is no money, I will not preach. Take your Bible, take your phone, send message through social media, preach the gospel with the resource that God has provided. No matter how we lead you, God will honor it. He will take it over from there. That's how we disciple people. That's how we trust in God for provision. Don't hope on big cooperation. Somebody that barely knows Christ is not going to finance heaven for you. If you want people who don't know God to finance heaven for you, they will take you to their own form of heaven. And I bet you will not like it. Christians should participate in doing the work of God. They should finance it. They should take the gospel to the lost. If the churches and the missionary and the Christians join hands together to reach out in great commission, Christ will return in tomorrow. Because we'll finish the mission in no time. But when the church separates themselves from the mission, the Great Commission takes a thousand years. Because the missionary does not have the resource. And the work are not in the church. The work are in the villages. They are in the unrich areas. Where people are holding plates, waiting for you to put food as a servant of God. And where you yourself can barely feed three square meal a day. But they expect you to put food. Jesus feed 12,000. You, you should be able to feed at least 10. And that is exactly what God expects from us. So as Christians, we should learn the principle and the fundamentals. There is no day I turn up my page that I don't have people asking for help. When I myself, all I do is send salary. And use those salary for the work of the ministry. But people call every day because the mission is not the work of one man. In fact, it's bigger than one man. No one man can actually succeed in preaching the gospel or doing the work of the mission all in law. The early apostles did not do it by themselves. God expects us not to do it by ourselves. God expects us to team up as a group. And that is the purpose. Why, why did I bring this in? Since we are not into the training on money. But the reason is because Christians need to know this. Why you disciple people? Train them up in the foundation. To know that the resources needed for the work of God are always scarce. But if believers will commit to God, then the work will be done in no time. 
We have been able to carry this mission for the past 10 years without any donation or offering from any group. Do you know why? Because we commit to it. We reach more than 10 villages in Nigeria all by the labor and by the work of hands without any donation from anybody. The teams are not rich people. They are poor village workers. Some are farmers. Some are hand traders, petty village traders who has nothing at all. But yet, we are able to take the gospel every year. I have to labor, sometimes move away from the location of the mission, which ought not to be done because the resources are not just there. We have to source for it to be able to do the work of the ministry. God expects this from a leader. The Bible says we should lead by example. Because you cannot disciple people if you don't do the things you are telling your disciple to do in the first place. Children does not learn from their parents because their parents say do not steal. They learn because they don't see their parents stealing. And he said unto them, take nothing for your journey. Take nothing. A laborer is worthy of his wages. And for your journey, neither stabs, nor sweets, neither bread, nor neither money, neither have two clothes or shoes, coats, or pets. Do you know why? God wants to demonstrate to the disciple that a laborer is worthy of his wages. If God has the resource to send you, he is able to take care of you while in the field. In my first ministry, this was the command I received. And I went all the way from Germany to Nigeria. And I stayed in the mission field for one year following this law. While in that field, we were able to still give clothes to those who were clothless. Without taking two clothes with me when I was going to the ministry. Why? Because if you believe the word of Christ and act according to it, you will know that the resources for his word are there in the village. Because most missionaries, when they are going to mission, they have bottled water. And they have some plates with extra food in case they don't like the food the villager provides. They have some vaccine kits that we wear out in some six months. But what happened when the vaccine wear out? <laughs> but I tell you, if you go with faith, the Lord knew there were all those things in the field. He knew there was the villagers survived in those villages. Some of them survived by famine. Some of them survived by rearing cattle. Some of them survived in a way you can never even imagine. Bind up your mind to survive this way. If those people in that field survive, try to survive like them. If the Lord sends you into a location, trust in God. Follow the rights of the villagers. Copy their method and their mechanisms. Once they eat, eat it, you will not die. The Lord, in fact, will bless your food and water. He will remove sickness and diseases far from you. That is what we do when we go for mission. We don't go to mission because we have enough bread in the boots. We have some bag of rice inside the mission van so that when we get to the village we have our own stove. We can cook our own food. No. On rare occasion whatever we have we give it to the man that hosts us. So, whatever he provides, we eat. Whether it's the food you are used to or not. Because the Bible says, we are, we are, whoever receives you, you should stay in that same house. No matter how poor or how rich. When the Lord sent his prophet, Elijah, to the widow of Zarephath, he did not send Elijah to a very rich widow. 
he sent Elijah to a widow that has the last food to eat and that she and her son. When the prophet get there, he understood that God sent him there for provision. And when he got there, if God want to provide for this prophet, why do we need to send him the prophet to a house? Why not just provide for the prophet when he was hiding in the wilderness? No. God sent her him to somebody that also need help. And when he got there, the little food they have sustained them until the day God sent them. And I tell you, if God sent me to the ministry, don't tell me. I wanted to go and preach the gospel, but money is stopping me. God did not send Jesus with a bad load of money. In fact, Jesus was so broke that he has to send Peter to fish to pay for tax. To pay the temple tax, he had to go and fish. That was the man that sent him. The money should not be the strategy. Oh, if I have billions, I have tried it. I disobeyed God once. God said, go empty handed. I carry a truck into the mission field. I never saw the truck, not the goose. Everything disappeared. Because that is not. When we ask for help in the mission, it's not so that we can preach the gospel. It's so that we can help the people who are suffering in that location. That is charity. It has nothing to do with the mission. The mission and charity are separate. Treat them separately. The people of God should sponsor the work of God. Don't expect somebody will come from abroad to sponsor the work that God has called you to do. Gather your team together. If it is five cover they can raise, it should be enough. Use it until God send rain. And I bet you he will always send rain. God has not called us to lack. He called us to abundance. And I believe he will always send rain. The message I had, but they are the truth. In verse 4, he makes us understand that whatsoever has you enter into, stay there. Stay there. Don't leave. Don't say this house is just too poor. They only have two toilets. They don't have water system. They don't have campus for me. I remember the first help I asked for when I was in the mission field. I asked her for a church who wrote me two days later and told me to donate to him because he wanted to buy a speed yard for mission. I was in a village where I was, the, the people that asked me were a family that had five children sleeping in one, one room and power store. And I was to sleep with the five children who would piss on my suits before they break. But a pastor is asking me from overseas to donate for his yard for, me, for the same mission work. And I look at the pastor and stop writing. Because I don't even have food where we struggle sometimes go to bed empty stomach. For the ministry. And yet we preach the gospel. That was the best mission experience I ever had. A lot of sick were healed. A lot of death were raised. But the resource did not follow those healing. When we heal and raise the sick and we cast out devils, we don't ask anything in return because the Lord who sent us said freely, you were given. Freely you receive from me, freely give. And that is what we do. Because we did not, He did not charge us money to give those gifts to us. So why should we charge money preaching there? In fact, the church was so poor that we did not even need to collect offering because there was no offering every Sunday. I passed up church for three months 
My reward for three months was a loaf of bread and a can of milk. That was how rich the church was. Then, if God has given us that ministry, that we have to labor with our hands to save, why can't you serve the Lord and wait for God on time for Him to lift you up? I remember what he told me when I begin to when everything looked down in my life. I don't even want to know where the next food, the next day was coming from. And I heard a voice say, Whenever things are done, you don't know what to do. Look up to the hills where your head comes from. Because your head does not come from man. A lot of us think our head comes from our fellow pastor. Our head comes from the big church. The big church would rather buy private debt rather than sponsor mission. So I bet you, they will not sponsor you. Look up to God who sent you. He is faithful. And if you believe he is faithful, believe you me, he is more than able to do the work he has sent you to do. He said, take not two loaves. You know why? Because the resource you need for the work, he has placed it not in your house, not in your bank accounts, but in the feed. That is the resource. Somebody will pray for his child. Keep us in the feed and fed us while we're in the feed. He didn't ask me, Pastor, we need money. He was a poor farmer. Sometimes, out of pity, I have to look for extra change to give to them so that all of us can eat from them. He took care of us. They were poor. He said, I cannot fold my hand in his world and see the servant of God stay in the street. I will have him come to my house. That is because there are still people on earth, no matter how wicked people are, who has the mind of God. People don't sponsor the ministry because they are rich. People sponsor the ministry because they have the mind of God. If some people say, God bless me with money, I will sponsor the work of God. If you do not sponsor the work of God when you have five naira, you will not sponsor the work of God when you have ten billion. You are the same. People do not change suddenly because they became rich. So let's learn. In verse 5, he make us understand and whosoever will not receive you. When you go out of that city, shake off the dust. That's all. Why would you shake off your dust from your shoe? As a testimony against such person. Lord, I have come here. They refuse to receive me. The work you sent me here to do, there are provisions for you. If you want the mission to do what the mission promised, follows the requirements of the mission. When you get to any town, nobody ref everybody refuses to ask you because you have not come with private jet for the ministry. Don't worry. Shake up your dust. God, I came to this town to preach your word, but the people refuse to receive me. Preach to anybody that accepts you in the street. If they also refuse you, shake your dust and leave. Go to the next town. And look what Jesus said about that person. And they depart and went through all the town preaching the gospel, healing everywhere. Do you know why? They will obey what Christ said. They did not take two shoes. They did not gather clothes and boots. They did not gather money into their pots. They did not gather words for themselves while they were going. And the Bible says, every word that Christ said come to pass. Every word. If it came to pass, God told me, there is one word I mark in my Bible. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If it was the same in the days of Paul, what makes you see 
Today he is going to change who he is because of you. In fact, he just hates you so much. He doesn't want you to prosper in the field. So he hates you. He is going to change his world because of you. He is not going to change because of who you look like. Or because of the color of your hair. No. God is God and is still the same. We have spent much time, so brethren, I think we should just be rounding up. This teaching is quite elaborate. If you want to finish it, join our equit mission training and you will be able to learn more about discipleship. Amazing! A pastor or a man of God can have the power to disciple people if he chooses. Because some Christians would not just want to disciple people. Look again at what happened when you disciple people. If one man learned the gospel and taught 15 men, what happened? So 15 men sat and learned in the same place. Step two, if 15 men taught each other, 12 more men and women, all 195 people heard and copied the lesson. What happened if 195 men and women went to their home, far and wide, each taught 6 and 12 more men? So in total, we have about 1,500 people heard and copy and they sat down and learned the gospel. That's step one. That is what happened when we disciple a church. Stop telling me the church is not just growing. Maybe because I have not prayed enough. Maybe because we have not discipled enough. That the power of disciple in action. Remember that all this took place in homes, under tree, in a quiet place. Avoid police persecution and no expensive building. Equipment, test books are used in this study. In some mission field, we don't even have money to print booklet for them. So we write it on board so they can study it. Copying and prayer just like helping what happened in the countryside, in the first country. After Jesus told the people to go and what? Make disciples. Use the material available to you for the gospel. That's why we make our teaching free online. So you can download those teachings. Sometimes we put it into an app. You download it to your phone for those who can afford phone. For those who cannot afford phone, the team leaders can copy it down. Either print it in a cheap book where he can offer it to them for a lesser price or take it. Do the hard work. Take Bible or pen, write it on a wooden board so that the people can copy it to their individual notes. These are a method of teaching. Going into Bible school for a year or two, only way to learn God's way? No. You can learn it from your home. You can learn. That's why we have CGF online, where we teach every day the gospel, the word of God. So you can you don't need to be supervised. You can take it from there. Learn in group. Take your group. And experience, experiment what you learn, and it work every single time. When all they find money, time, family, work, church, where will you find the teacher, the building, the barracks, the meal to bring 500 people together one week? You have to pay for both fare. You have to look for 500 sleeping mats. 500 toilet places, 500 notebook, pens, 10,000 meals, and water over the week. 
You don't have offering. You don't have tax. Where is the money going to come from? And your salary is not even enough to sponsor your family. And you still have family to take care of. Is there any other way? The rabbis also have fish schools. But Jesus chose another way to be. What way? Jesus sat on the mountain top. Under a tree sheet. God expected to be the same. Not expensive. There is room for everyone to come. How did Jesus train his follower? Jesus spent much time personally training small group. Till 12, 72. They became friends. He taught them privately. They learned more. At public meeting, they were sent to travel and try everything they have learned for themselves. And when they turned, they told Jesus all about it. In Matthew 10 verse 1, Luke 9 verse 1 to 10, 1 and 1 to 20, 10 verse 1 to 24, be warned at the beginning. Disciple releases God's word and his spirit that brings out the best and the worst in you. The discipleship releases God's word, God's spirit. It brings out the best and the worst character you have. Discipleship brings early loss, but great inner and eternal gain. On one occasion, disciple were roaring across a lake when a storm hit them and were in the center of God's will, but they still got very wet and frightened. Matthew 8, verse 23 to 27. But Paul also made disciple. When he traveled, he took a team with him. And they learned by seeing what Paul did. By doing the same. Acts 20, 4 to 5. When Paul was in Ephesus, that is email. In the modern Turkey, he found some believers who were so ignorant they had never heard of the Holy Spirit. So Paul taught them, prayed for them, and met them every day for over two years. They led at the feet of older men in as apprentice or disciple. What do you think? <coughs> they are effective evangelism because two years the whole province heard the word of the Lord. There were extraordinary miracles. The fear of God fell on the city. People burned their magic books. God's word spread and grows in power. And those ignorant disciples became the elders of the churches of Ephesus. Adding and multiplication. Church usually grow by adding one or two more people. Come to hear the gospel. But grow by multiplication. Many hears the Bible, responds to God's love, and then the self church begin where they live. This can happen in your village. Just give us a call. We can take you step by step to through this training in more detail and help you to start up. You don't need money. You don't need so much work to start this. It means remembering. Write it down all that you learn. Organize yourself to a regular pass. Eat on to a group of friends. <coughs> Who will then go and tell others? Paul gave his young disciple <coughs> Timothy three steps. The things you have heard me say and trust them to reliable people. Who will be able to go and tell others also those your disciples meet together maybe at home to tell them all you have learned in the lesson tell them what they can learn in the future by coming back then organize your friends to also pass God's word to order second timothy 2 2 second king 7 verse 9 all these things are made for you christians should know 
that God is not mock concerning his promise. Whatever a man sows, he will reap. You cannot stay at home and procrastinate. Oh, God called me. Uh, it's because there is no money. I would have gone out. Try today. Start the world. I remember what God said to me. He, he sent me into a church. We had met only four people. I was discouraged in my spirit. I said, God, all these days of wandering in the forest, you sent me to preach to four people. The Lord says, start the world. Start the world. And that is what I'm going to tell you today. Start the world. The Lord will bring people that will hear you. The Lord will bring people that will listen to your message. The Lord will bring people. It is not your job. It is his job. No man can come to him and says he, the father himself, draweth him or her to himself. Just as no man can come to your ministry and say God draw them. God is going to draw people to you. This is where we end today. We shall pray. But before we pray, the Lord is asking you today, join the people of God, build with God people. You will have your reward. The Bible says, Blessed are those that turn many to righteousness. They shall shine like the beauty of the firmament, like a star forever. God is asking you to join in propagating this gospel. If you cannot go, send us your resource. It will help to take the gospel to the unrich. God expects there is a platform, a church, Currently in Congo, that has about 50 people that they want to motivate into the mission. They are having seminars to sensitize the missionaries. If you want to support them, the link is in our website. You can assist such a church to go out and preach the gospel in various locations. As you do, God bless you. It is not a false offering. The Lord does not expect you to give what you do not have for His service. The Lord expects you, whatever you can afford, give it for the service of God. CGF has been known, has existed for the past 10 years. That's why our little resources, we don't go begging. We don't carry back from street to street, asking people to help in the building of the work of the ministry. We believe that the God, work of God can be financed by God's people. God help you as you participate. Join our fellowship today. Go to our website at cgfnslogin.app. Register with us. Participate in all our meetings. Our training take part every Sunday by 5 p.m. for understanding prophecy, where we join together to understand all biblical prophecy. Then on Tuesday by 7 p.m., we meet together for Open Heart Fellowship where we take you on our various mission training online. And this training can also be in complete format in the school. We train you on our quick mission to prepare you for the work of God and for the work of the ministry. Our teachings are not just Bible sermon. They are meant to disciple you until you are matured enough to preach the gospel to others. As the things you have heard and received, God expects you not only to consume it, but to commit it to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, your word has come forth. Your people have heard it. As many that receive him, the Bible said to them, he gave power. As many that will receive your word today, Lord, give them power. As many that will hear the sound of my voice and will listen from their various sects, various locations around the world, Lord, let them receive power to witness. Let them receive power to become your disciple. Let them receive power to do the impossible. Let them receive power to minister grace to the hearer. Let them receive power to lay their hands upon the sick and they will recover. Oh Lord, let them take the serpent by the hands and nothing shall by enemies hurt them. For the Lord, in your name, they will cast out devil, heal all manner of diseases, and affliction will cease from their home. Because your word is settled in heaven, and you said to me, affliction will not rise the second time. 
As many, O oh Lord, that are still in body, Lord, we pray that your kingdom be preached in their life. That the word of God that is strong, quick, and powerful, sharper than any two edged sword, should pierce every heart, should design the interests and the knowledge, and should bring all things to the accountability of God's presence. Let God's name alone be glorified in the life of his people. Father Lord, as many that are coming to this program, being sick, having affliction, whatever things that disturb their marriage, their home, their finance, Father Lord, meet them at the very point of their name. Send your word and heal them from their disease. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. God bless you, brethren, until we see you again next week.